Hello and welcome to another episode of the Classical Republican. I am in Venice, as you can plainly see here. And I am reading uh, Cosmopolitanism of Nations. Now this is, uh, I'm going to be reading uh, what's called here on uh, chapter 17 on public opinion in, and England's international leadership. Uh, however, it was originally called the People's International League. Um, before I explain the difference in the titles, uh, so the, um, this is kind of the reason why this collection was put together uh, by Princeton, um, uh, by Stefano Recia and Nadia Urbinati. Um, you know, this is kind of a reaction to the war in Iraq and, um, uh, you know, nation building at that time, uh, where, the, um, you, you know, George, uh, President uh, George W. Bush is, um, you know, we've had the, the war on terror in Afghanistan, in uh, Iraq, and um, 2009, you don't know where else it's going. Well, I guess um, Obama has been elected, and uh, we kind of have a, um, uh, well, some would argue that he's continuing the, you know, the GWAT, the global war on terror policies of the Bush administration. Um, even though he campaigned to, to end them, uh, that does not, uh, that does not happen at that time. So they put out this book to talk about, um, Mazzini and, and how Mazzini influenced a lot of, uh, international organizations like the European Union, the League of Nations, later the United Nations. And, um, uh, in this one on public opinion in England's international leadership, it's talking about... Uh, what it's talking about what yeah, he expects of of Great Britain, who's like the the you know the main superpower at the time in the in this is in 1847, 1847. So that's very important um, because of what's going to happen the next year with all the revolutions all over Europe, and then the year after that, 1849, the Roman Republic. Um, so that's basically the, the gist, that's what the editors wanted to call it on public opinion in England's international leadership. However, it was originally entitled the People's International League because there, there, there was this uh, People's International League, it was London-based, um, and its mission uh, was to enlighten the British public as to the political conditions in foreign countries as well as international relations between those countries, to disseminate the principles of national freedom and progress, to engage in public advocacy in favor of the right of every people to self-government and the maintenance of their own nationality to promote a better understanding among the peoples of different countries. Now, this never really became an international, you know, it was, it's, it's London-based, um, it's called the International League, uh, but it never really has any... Um, any organization outside of, of England. Um, so let's go on to this writing. Yeah, he talks about um, kind of what's expected of England. Okay, he says, Would we then like to see England at the head of a crusade, unleashing war on Europe and burdening, burdening her people with the responsibility of hurling on mankind the force of revolutionary winds? So he's asking, you know, should England be uh, be sending their, uh, you know, their their soldiers, their uh, their young people to fight and die uh, for all these uh, revolutions? Should they be fighting the revolutions for uh, for these people? He says, no, far from it. Uh, but we would certainly like England's behavior to change. And then he talks about uh, precedents in the past. So this is in 1847. And he brings up all these precedents uh, where, where um, Great Britain did use force, but it was, it was very, very limited. So the one example he brings up, is um, in 1808 uh, in Spain to halt Napoleon's attempt to stifle um, the the um, you know that 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 nation's existence there. 
Uh, and then also what they've done to put an end to the slave trade. So this is 1847. They put the an end to uh, slavery throughout the empire. Um, and they're also trying to, at this time, trying to stop the slave trade. Um, so, and, and actually, I believe it was in the 1830s when, yeah, Webster, uh, Secretary of State Webster, was he a Webster? Yeah. Um, uh, actually tried to, um, uh, well, actually had a, uh, arranged for like a, a joint effort between the United States and the, the, uh, and Great Britain to, uh, stop the slave trade off of, uh, the coast of West Africa. Um, okay. So then, so this is not... Yeah, so so he doesn't want um, Great Britain. He doesn't think that they should be, you know, engaging in direct warfare. To you know, um, you know, maybe even regime change, like they uh, you might call it um, in two thousand nine. Um, uh, so he does believe that you should that uh, the the superpower sh uh, should have the threat should provide a threat of counter intervention. So when some people want to rise up against the, you know, and form their own nation, um, you know, you can provide some moral support, but also have a, um, you know, the threat of counter intervention. And later on, we do see this um, uh, when Italy actually comes into being. You do have a great, you know, you have the the, the Royal Navy that, um, you know, comes into the Mediterranean to show the other powers that uh, they need to allow these, um, uh, you know, well, they need to uh, allow these, uh, these nations to exist. Um, and then you have to, you know, you should also make your policy and opinion known. Um, you know, this reminds me of the big stick of... Uh, of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt uh, talked about the big stick, and really what that was was not necessarily, um, you know, going and invading other countries, but uh, <laughs> but to uh, make your uh, make your wishes known, and then to have the threat of for or the the threat of use of force uh, nearby. Actually, uh, make it an actual. Um, uh, the, the possibility of making it an actual reality. And so that's why he wanted, you know, Theodore Roosevelt wanted a uh, strong Navy to be able to project power. And, um, and so, so it's more of like a, a big stick effort. Um, and, and Teddy Roosevelt never actually fought a, uh, during his presidency, never actually fought, um, a real war that partially because of his, uh, you know, big stick policy. Um, so we have threat of uh, counter intervention, making your po uh, policy and opinions known, and then you have to have this bottom up momentum from the people, from that the people who want to create the nation. So you can't have, um, you know, maybe what the U.S. did in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, sure you had the Northern Alliance, but they were kind of a ragtag team, um, just barely holding on. Uh, hiding in the mountains of northern Afghanistan, and that's what uh, President Bush chose. Uh, he kind of thought that was the bottom-up momentum. But I would also bring up the example of when, um, you know, after the first Iraq war um, that his father prosecuted, uh, you know, that was a war that had uh, a lot of international support from the UN, NATO, and, like, everybody, Except, except Iraq and like one other nation, um, and then the uh, then you had uh, then you had the Kurds who wanted to have their own nation afterwards, and um, you know his father George H W Bush uh, did, pro you know, uh, provided some rhetoric, but that you know uh, some people feel that uh, he could have provided uh, more force behind that rhetoric because Saddam Hussein was able to 
uh, crush the Kurdish uh, revolt, and um, so they they didn't really have their. Um, uh, eventually, they did get like a semi-autonomous. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it a nation, a region, um, and I think they became a little bit more semi-autonomous uh, after uh, uh, George W. Bush um, and that invasion. And so, yeah, um, I think the Gur the Kurds provide a good example of that. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's basically his uh, his policy for intervention and how the um, how a, a superpower who is trying to strive <laughs> for uh, you know peace and freedom throughout the world should act. And, um, but as far as the frame of the essay, the People's International League, that didn't, did not really pan out, uh, because of the events that happened in 1848, all the revolutions, and then in 1849, the Roman Republic. And of course, the Roman Republic was smashed by the, uh, uh by the French and Austrians. So, uh, until next time... Viva San Marco! Long live the Republic!